Today we have a very interesting event, launch of the new data sets uh, combined by the name CADGAT, I'm sorry, which stands for Central Asia Data Gathering and Analysis Team. I think we will appreciate very much the need for accurate and comprehensive data for policy analysis. And I think this is initiative was much welcome and we are all eager to, to learn what does this mean, what kind of data, what, how they collect it, what, what are the plans to, to use them, etc., etc. So we have uh, the following program. Uh, first, we have opening words by uh, Mr. Alexander Walters, the director of OEC Academy, whom most of you already know very well, uh, the host of the event, and then uh, Mr. Indra Overland will explain the, the initiative. And then we have three main presentations. I will provide titles one by one. Uh, now, if I would like to ask Mr. Walters to make his opening remarks. So. I switch it off. Okay. <laughs> I believe everybody can hear me if I speak, like I said, without microphone very well. Um, Dr. Mogilewski, thank you very much. Thank you also very much for your participation in today's seminar. I'm going to keep myself very short. Welcome to our CatGAT discussion today, to our afternoon, in which we try to make sense of data that were collected over the last year. Before I came up here, I had a chance to check on our website. We actually do CatGAT since 2009. That was when we published the first set of data. And with CatGAT, as well as with a couple of other research projects that we have been doing here at the Academy over the past 10 to 15 years. One of the problems we sometimes face is we have great data, and that's it. There's not much of work done on this data, or let's say there are opportunities we have not used to the extent we could use, actually, our data to come forward with conclusions and analysis of states of affairs in different dimensions of social realities here in Central Asia. I'm very happy that today we were actually able to collect so many of you to come together to listen to the three presentations and then also engage together in a round of questions and discussions of, okay, what would we like to gather data on in future endeavors of a similar kind? Indra is going to lead this discussion and is going to hear closely to what you have to say. From our side at the Academy, we are very happy that we are able to host such events and we are looking to have many more in the future to come. We are currently preparing our uh, future cooperation with Nupi, and I hope we will be able to engage much more in research and also in analysis and, and, and data gathering in years to come. Once again, thanks for your participation, and I hope you have a nice and lovely afternoon together with us. Thank with you very much. Uh, yeah, well, let me now turn to Professor Indra Overland, who is research professor and head of the energy program at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, NUPI, which I understand is a permanent partner of the academy. And uh, Professor uh, Overland has his PhD from uh, University of Cambridge, and he has uh, extensive experience of working in Central Asia since 2001. As far as I learned, speaks perfect uh, Russian, and uh, he works on many area, issues of energy and, and, and related uh, topics in the Central Asian context. Uh, please. Thank you. So, <clears throat> my task is to explain what is this CADGAT, this CADGAT thing. Um, <clears throat> CADGAT is the Central Asia data gathering and analysis team, uh, and it consists of one researcher in each of the five countries in Central Asia, one local researcher uh, who knows local language and uh, local conditions. And <clears throat> the purpose of CADGAT is to uh, create data which, which are consistent insofar as possible across all five countries. Um, <clears throat> which then make it possible to compare the countries, to see, see the, the differences between the countries, and to see the overall situation in Central Asia on different areas. Uh, and these are made available on the internet uh, for free, so anybody can access them on the web pages of the OEC Academy. And they are intended for students, for uh, researchers, journalists, 
government officials, international organizations uh, inside the region and uh, also people outside the region with an interest in the region. <clears throat> and CatCat doesn't have a fixed thematic focus. Uh, so it's a kind of a, it's like a university. It covers all uh, kinds of subjects. Uh, but we've tried over the years to, to select subjects uh, either where somebody in the team had some special competence and or where we thought that it, um, it, it, it's a hot topic that it would be good to get some data out on or where there's a lack of information. So to give you some examples of the kinds of topics we've covered in the past, it includes uh, narcotics trade and related issues in Central Asia. And there we were, uh, uh, among other things, checking the, the retail price of heroin in all of the capitals of Central Asia. So we tried to do some original uh, kind of uh, uh, research of really, um, <clears throat> not just gathering statistics, but, but uh, getting our, our hands dirty a bit and uh, interact, get, really getting into society. We've also uh, done <coughs> CADGAP data sets on language use and language policy in Central Asia. And this has turned out to be the most used uh, CADGAT data ever. <coughs> We've done uh, some on gender and politics, including the uh, representation of women in parliaments across the Central Asian countries. Trade barriers and tariffs. Uh, holidays. We've done two CADGAP reports on holidays in Central Asia. And you may wonder why, uh, uh, but it's actually a kind of an original social science agenda because holidays say a lot about a society. It says something about uh, religion and something about politics. It says something about uh, post-Soviet communist heritage uh, and something about how hard people work and how lazy they are. Um, and we've done reports on media, radio, television, newspapers, and so on. <clears throat> These are all in the past. Um, I'll say, in a moment, I'll say a little bit more about what we are, the, the new reports which are coming out now and which we are going to present here. The reason why we are having uh, this, uh, this little event today um, is that uh, we would like to make CADGAT better known, as Alexander was saying. It's a resource that's there, it's an opportunity uh, for students for researchers to find data already gathered, or even maybe to suggest some data that they need uh, and for us to gather them, if, if it's possible for us. I mean, if it's a good topic and not to resource, demands too much resources. <clears throat> so we want to, to highlight this, and I remember in the first years of CADGAT, if you Googled CADGAT, which, is, which was made to be a, a unique uh, name, uh, but still it wouldn't come up in Google. But uh, the last five years, if you go CADGAT, the, the OEC Academy webpage, uh, CADGAT webpage will come up immediately. So, <clears throat> uh, we've gradually it's becoming better known, but we still have a way to go in terms of making the opportunities uh, known to more people. And that's one reason to have the seminar, to, to, to spread the word. And I uh, think the, uh, the academies. Uh, uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, communications machinery will also be uh, making this known uh, on the be on social media. So if any of you see this on Facebook or uh, Twitter or LinkedIn, feel free to repost and give it a like and so on. Something about the seminar or something. Say I was there too. <clears throat> Another reason why we are uh, a, giving this seminar. Um, is because the current reports, which are going to come out now, after the seminar, uh, were produced by a new team of CADGAT researchers. So we had a recruitment process, a public call last year, uh, and interviewed people from several people from each of the Central Asian countries, and recruited a new team. And this is the first production of this team. Uh, so we are celebrating that, and. <clears throat> We are celebrating the fact that, as Alexander mentioned, it is, we started CADGAT in 2009, and now it's 2019, which means that this is the 10th anniversary of CADGAT. So, happy birthday to CADGAT. Um, and finally, uh, we are producing, uh, over the coming weeks, we will be publishing uh, 11 new reports in two 
uh, thematic areas. New, these are two new thematic areas. Uh, so that's maybe the main purpose of the seminar, is to present these specific reports uh, and to make sure people know about them. And the two topics we are covering are BRI, which is China's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we have chosen this topic because it is very hot. And uh, my colleague here from Nupi, Roman, and I um, uh, monitor quite closely and have see some uh, online activity, what people are interested in, and so on. And BRI is uh, very hot, not just in Central Asia, but also in Southeast Asia uh, and globally. Um, people want to know more about it. People want data and publications. Um, and there are growing concerns about China in the region. China is an immensely uh, big and powerful actor, which is increasingly playing a role everywhere in the world, even in Norway, where I come from. The, the presence of Chinese capital, of Chinese tourists, of Chinese uh, political influence, in, or attempts at political influence in Norway and in Sweden. Sweden is currently uh, subject to a, a quite a severe political campaign uh, from China. <coughs> on a very interesting basis. So everybody is interested in China, not just Trump. Uh, and uh, it's good to know more uh, and to find out more with an open mind. <coughs> and we've tried to gather quite just factual data about uh, BRI uh, projects, uh, BRI and other Chinese projects in Central Asia. And the other thematic area we're going to cover today is renewable energy. Um, in the world, uh, or Central Asia is traditionally thought of as being important in the world because it has energy resources, oil and gas, and hydropower. Um, but in the world, there is now an energy transition going on. Uh, 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 we have the Paris Agreement, uh, which is very ambitious. Uh, and which is not implemented yet, but which is supposed to be implemented during the coming years at an accelerated rate, and to which all of the Central Asian countries are signatories and have ratified, and also neighboring China and Russia. <coughs> um, and uh, this energy transition that is going on in the world isn't reflected properly in the research in and on Central Asia. So the research uh, is, hasn't made its own energy transition. It's still a little bit talking uh, more focused on oil and gas and then the hydropower than on wind and solar and their interaction with hydropower. Um, and we think that renewable energy is going to become more important in the future in the world, uh, a lot more important. Uh, and it's going to be, become more important in this region. So we want to be a little bit, try to help the, the research in this area catch up a little bit by providing some easily available data uh, showing uh, potentials, uh, ongoing projects and facility uh, or capacities and uh, what is planned for the future in the different uh, Central Asian countries. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Then let's proceed with the presentations on concrete topics. And our first presenter is Mr. Dr. Farkhodemi Jonov. Uh, he is professor researcher at Narcos University in Almaty and deputy director of the Center of Asian Institute for Strategic Studies. He holds PhD in global governance from Wilfred Lord Lurier University uh, in Canada. Is Okay, so uh, he will make a presentation on the topic China's Belt and Road Initiative in Central Asia from a project level perspective. And he is going to talk to us via Skype. Well, we have some technical issues, hopefully, it will be resolved now. Can you hear me? Yes. Actually, yeah, on that, from that, and it goes well, yeah. right? Okay, for what, the floor is yours, please. 
Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Ida, for making my introduction, <laughs> right, for the most part. So that's why I will jump directly to the presentation. And let me try to share the screen with you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Health and Growth Initiative and the Chinese Project. So, Indra has already made the introduction why VRI and studying Chinese projects are important. Right? So, I'm not going to stop on that. Have you guys thought about what's the difference between VRI and the Chinese projects implemented in Central Asia? It's just, if you know how to distinguish them, could you please raise your hands? We are not going into details. So, he's asking, uh, what is the difference between a Chinese project in Central Asia and a BRI project in Central Asia? Project. Does anyone okay. have an answer? The thing is that, well, uh, this question does not require any answer at, at this moment. When we talk about this project, and the first step was that we started, uh, actually, uh, I also started asking experts working on China in Central Asia, whether they have a specific characteristics which would distinguish BRI projects from simply bilateral Chinese projects in Central Asia. And actually none of them had a clear answer and clear, clear um, factors or categories according to which they would have defined different projects and distinguish them. So that's why we thought probably it would be very interesting to collect data on all Chinese projects in Central Asian countries, mainly focusing on those which started in 2013 when the BRI was announced, and then try to distinguish BRI projects in Central Asia from simply bilateral Chinese projects in Central Asian countries. And for that, we have developed uh, a set of criteria. I will go to that in a moment. Uh, so the idea is to distinguish two different types of projects, and we try to add um, a set of particular characteristics. Okay, so we started looking at the BRI official website, uh, websites, and the projects publicly announced as the BRI. Okay, then we started looking at the projects which were financed by specific institutions created within the initiative of the Belt and Road. And then we started, we started comparing them to other projects presented by the Chinese companies, for example, right? On their websites and um, different kind of reports. We started looking at both hard infrastructure projects and the soft infrastructure projects or soft power projects. We took into account the project which started in 2013 and then continued. But also we considered some projects which started before 2013. But be because of their strategic importance, or the longer implementation period, which extended to 2013 and later, and then either the local government or Beijing declared, presented them as BRI, so we also looked at that, which started before 2013. And then we also looked at the projects which were uh, within the bilateral format or implementation to part within the bilateral format. And here, I, what I have in mind is the financing, the sources. Either it's just the finan uh, Chinese money spent on implementing a particular project in Central Asian countries, or whether other institutions are also involved, like the Asian Development Bank. World Bank, private enterprises. And we also consider the projects which pursue strategic objectives and those which had uh, mostly a commercial interest. So basically, we tried to collect any project that we could possibly uh, get our hands on, which links China to the Central Asia region. So because we succeeded to collect a lot of different kinds of projects, and uh, I think the, the, the total number was a little bit less than 300 in all five Central Asian countries, we divided them into four major categories. And these categories, which you see on the screen right now, they are not random. 
Three, uh, this are also the priorities set by the Belt and Road Initiative, which both Chinese government and the Central Asian government acknowledge. So basically four uh, major areas of cooperation. These are food and railroad connectivity, energy connectivity, and trade promotion and industrial development, and the people-to-people -people exchange. Because the trade promotion and industrial development uh, uh, covers the large share of the Chinese project in Central Asia, we also decided to divide them into smaller parts, depending on a particular area in which those projects are being promoted in Central Asia region. When it comes to sources, answering to one of your questions, Indra has highlighted that we study statistical community databases for East Central Asian countries. We look at international and local reports. We study all different sources uh, in mass media. And then we also conducted expert interviews. We talk to the government people, we talk to researchers, scholars who work on this particular issue and ask them whether they can point out where we have information about each of that particular point. Okay, and the data collection was carried out between August 2018 and January 2019. So as I said, we have come up with five, uh, actually more than five, that would be eight reports in total for BRI. So the first overview report compares all five Central Asian countries to each other and also compares different categories, different areas of cooperation, both within the BRI and of the Chinese projects in the region. So here you can see that uh, this is the total number of the projects. About by country, and, 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 and then here you have the trade promotion, railroad, connectivity, energy connectivity, and the people-to-people -people exchange. So looking at this, you can easily judge which areas are actually receiving a priority. To make a more, basically, to have a more comprehensive analysis, then we also look into the total investments, right? Just because, for example, in Kyrgyzstan there are lots of uh, projects when it comes to people to people exchange, it doesn't mean that a lot of money is being invested in this particular area. So we look uh, into the total number of investments. Of course, they this are the calculations of all the projects that we could find. It doesn't mean that they represent 100% uh, accuracy like total investment. No. These are the calculations of the financing and the money for all the projects that we could find. Divided or compared and contrasted by different areas of cooperation and the countries. So you can see here which country receives a priority within the value of initiative which comes to implementing projects. Like here, Kazakhstan, uh, road infrastructure, about $15 billion, energy, a little bit less than $20 billion, right? Turkmenistan, almost $10 billion, but if you look at other countries, even in Uzbekistan, the total amount, you know, for this particular areas are much less. And then you can also compare them, not only the countries, but also by the categories. People to people exchange. Most of the time you don't really get the numbers how much money is being invested. Okay, because either the project is continuous or it's just a soft-powered type of motion which doesn't really have a complete sum of money or investment needed um, to run this. So uh, we have also looked into the bilateral and the multilateral Chinese projects, bilateral China and each of the Central Asian countries, together implementing a particular project and financing is coming either from China or both from China and from a Central Asian country, and we also look into the multilateral projects, right? Where the investment uh, package is actually uh, quite diverse. This is also, I think, a very interesting observation. Here you can uh, see that the priority is given for bilateral cooperation rather than multilateral cooperation, right? Again, by each particular segment. So actually, a lot of people can use this information. Uh, for their own research in making a particular argument depending on what they are studying. We also looked into the commercial and strategic interest behind the Chinese project in Central Asia, and we tried to distinguish them. 
Of course, this part was a little bit difficult because there is no a complete set of criteria which would say this project is commercial and this project pursues all the strategic goals. Sometimes some projects they pursue both strategic and commercial. So that was um, basically uh, up to our researchers to define whether this particular project fits primarily uh, strategic objective or pursues economic financial uh, interest, business interest. And I don't know if you have, if you have right now the printed out database that we have collected, but here you can see it's just an example. So we have all the criteria at the very top and then we have a country country divided by each particular area of cooperation, projects, year of implementation, uh, this is the financing, who is financing and how much money is being invested, this part, whether this project was ever labeled as BRI or do we have to make our own judgment on this, was the project, project local, limited to one particular region uh, in one country or does it have a strategic kind of regional importance, whether it's a bilateral or multilateral, and then the last part here covers most, uh, basically in terms of space, uh, the largest part of our uh, reports, because this last column requires explanation why we consider this project to be commercial or a study. Okay, so that's how we try uh, to distinguish them, local and regional. As I have just highlighted, this is this is the overview report, the large report that we have come up with. And then, because we have found so many different projects and information about each particular area of cooperation in each country, we decided to, to break them out into smaller pieces. It would be first easier to digest, it would be first easier to understand, and the second, you can use, depending on what topic you are studying, you can use information from a uh, separate area of cooperation, so not everything is just mixed in one page. So these following are the thematic report. Smaller ones. Open railroad infrastructure, so you can see we have this uh, general table comparing countries in terms of number of the projects and the total funding. But then the rest has actually six different categories. It's just to make it uh, more understandable. We decided to focus on two when it comes to comparison. And every single report has an introduction, background, and key findings. In this key findings, we are trying to highlight the most important observation of ours in regards to the project implementation in this particular area. For example, road and railroad infrastructure. Most of the projects, they are local in nature. It's just one segment of the road, one segment of the road in Tajikistan, in Kyrgyzstan, and in Uzbekistan. However, the last one explains that this project, walk in nature, building renovating road, actually fits into a regional network that the Chinese and Central Asian countries are trying to promote. And, and the financing varies from tens of millions to a few billions of dollars. So, quite diverse. And then the energy connectivity. This uh, area receives perhaps the largest share of investments coming from China in the region. So, without doubt, energy connectivity is one of the priority uh, area of cooperation between China and Central Asian countries. And also the same structure starts with uh, the background and the key findings, and the key findings are the most important, the most interesting, the most intriguing or uh, paradoxical uh, information and observations that we have made while studying the projects implemented within this particular area of cooperation. And again, for example, the projects, they differ, they vary from a small one with a couple of millions of dollars of investment, up to seven billion dollars of investment for Central Asia, China, gas pipeline. And here you can see Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. This is the priority in the sense that more and more projects are being implemented, but if you look into the total funding, in Kazakhstan lots of money being invested, but in Uzbekistan not that much. 
What's the reason? And then there is this slight explanation saying that Uzbek has just started uh, pushing forward the idea of cooperation, regional integration with this new leadership. And that's how most of the projects are in the implementation stage. Not that concrete money has been invested so far. A people to people exchange. Very important when people talk about the Chinese soft power in Central Asia, however, our data uh, confirms that this is not a priority when it comes to concrete projects. Uh, the first number of the projects are limited, and when it comes to the funding, we don't really know how much money is going where. And, and then uh, we have trade promotion and industrial development, which we move down into four smaller categories. And again, this is because it's easier to understand, and because this smaller, uh, like, uh, internal part of the trade promotion and industrial development in itself constitute actually a big and large sector of cooperation. Okay? Agriculture and food is a priority, but not really like energy or uh, road and railroad infrastructure. Uzbekistan the investment is limited, and we have highlighted only three countries because of only for three countries we could find projects in agricultural sector, the Chinese food sector. Right? So, perhaps uh, Turkmenistan is not really uh, the country where China looks for promoting cooperation in agricultural sector. Um, is for the industry. Kazakhstan is Uzbekistan the largest number of the projects. But again, in Uzbekistan, most of the projects, they are in the initial stage. Kazakhstan receives most of the money when it comes to the industrial sector development. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, there are also projects, but the projects, they are either limited in scale or in terms of financing. And here you can see that like uh, the, the force keep finding Uzbekistan are in planning stage, being implemented in 2017, investment package was signed for $27 billion. So in future we might see the trend uh, for uh, the positive trend for increasing cooperation. Keep finding for energy and mineral resources, exploration, extraction and processing. And again, Kazakhstan is a limit, uh, followed by other countries. This is the total number of the projects, comparison, and this is the total funding invested in this particular area. So Turkmenistan is in the second place, despite the fact that there are few, only few projects are implemented in Turkmenistan, but because they are large in scale in terms of investments, Turkmenistan is the second destination and one of the priorities for China. And that's again communication, communication connectivity, Again, projects are quite limited. The only exception, and this is an interesting part, Kazakhstan. Right? So in Kazakhstan, China has, Kazakhstan government signed several agreements, creating funds and financial uh, instruments to support projects on this territory. And that's why the financing, financial institution part, has actually covered up a lot of space in terms of money for BRI project implementation in the region. So again, this is the comparison. We have a detailed breakdown of all the projects under every single report that we have so far. So uh, uh, basically, that's it. And if you have any questions, we will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Papa. Any questions? To... Well, while people are thinking, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, about the financial values. I still don't quite got what is this the what is the amount? My is personal opinion is that China will definitely be successful in connecting Central Asia with China. However, BRI projects they have two components, major ones. The first they uh, they are designed to connect China with Central Asia and then through Central Asia with other regions so that China can trade with them. And the second component is that all these infrastructure projects, they, they are supposed to have local economies develop and local economies grow. So for the first part, I'm sure that China can, uh, uh, you know, succeed in achieving those objectives. But for the second part, whether all these projects can actually boost local economies, uh, I have some doubts. Yeah, please. The last question. Hello, Farhad. 
Sebastian. Hi. Hello, Sebastian. Can you uh, shortly elaborate the spillover effect of uh, Chinese investments and especially the BRI investments? Can we already observe uh, to what extent it has been contributing to the local development? Um, so, in some of the projects we have mentioned, for example, in Tajikistan, China uh, is opening up a cement uh, factory, and then local people are being employed. And then these factories, they are paying taxes. And I have also presented uh, for uh, several projects how many, how much money is being, uh, you know, um, uh, actually paid as taxes to the budget. <laughs> so in this sense, we can uh, have some figures, some data on how this projects are contributing to the local economy and local um, uh, economic development. Yeah, but not really something that we can overgeneralize right now and say that it's going to have a major spillover effect and that in five years, uh, um, I don't know, some of the countries will show a significant progress in terms of economic development. Because of this, I'm not sure yet. Thank you. And probably the last question, Roman. Uh, Parhot, uh, mm -hmm. a question uh, that, is, that is of a similar nature that Indra asked. Uh, as you remember, mm -hmm. the motivation behind uh, data gathering on Brie was that, well, there is a hypothesis that Brie itself is used as a soft power mechanism, as a soft power channel mm -hmm. to create a positive image of China. And that's why, mm -hmm. uh, as you remember, we were trying to distinguish between purely Brie yeah. projects and whether it's purely Chinese projects. So my question is, so what's your observation and what's your conclusion about it? Is it all about purely like Chinese engagement on the bilateral scale uh, with all the countries? Or in some cases we can really see that uh, Brie driven projects, they're very different from, from purely uh, bilateral Chinese projects. And if yes, then what's the percentage of those? Thank you. Um, in terms of percentage, it would be uh, a little bit difficult to say right now, but in our report, we have highlighted BRI projects in green and uh, uh, like bilateral Chinese projects in yellow. Of course, we can uh, a little bit discuss today on this, but for the most part, most of the projects, they are still bilateral projects. Um, when it comes to Central Asia China cooperation, Concerning the positive image, whether the BRI is bringing a positive image, uh, is also, I think, uh, from my observation, is quite the controversial uh, question and the answer would also hold the same. Because in the strategic and the commercial column, remember the last one, which has a detailed description, description of the project, in some of them we have highlighted certain problems with implementation and running those projects. Uh, for example, um, in Tajikistan, when, when China provided the money to uh, develop gold mines, uh, or when China provided the money to uh, build thermal power plants in Dushanbe, but the government had to uh, give you know, two gold mines to China to basically own and uh, operate those gold mines for the next uh, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years until the investments are equipped. Some experts consider this to be um, like a loss of sovereignty and the rather have a negative effect. And also, if you look into, uh, we're also trying to remember to look a little bit uh, on the, like we try to compare the GDP of the countries and also the, the amount of investments from China and when you see excessive dependence of some of the Central Asian countries on solely Chinese investments, then this particular fact also scares uh, some people, right? So whether the BRI has a positive uh, effect on improving the image of China, it's not black and white. So. And again, uh, there are so many, so much detailed information presented in this uh, reports that any researcher can take and analyze, can read this, and then make a conclusion for themselves. So, yeah, in this I cannot to push our opinion on it. Yeah, the very last question. Yeah, the very last question. My name is Shaslo, I'm from Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just have a suggestion. Uh, the data is great. But to uh, digest it more easily, it would be great if we had a person who could uh, process it. So you could have maps, like for example, uh, several <coughs> maps, one on people-to-people um, -people exchange, 
uh, where you can indicate with the red color the country which is uh, more of a high priority, and etc. etc. And the next thing, uh, I see the data, but I can't really compare some countries with each other because the data is absolute, right? So it would be great if you had some information, for example, on um, investment per square meter for Tajikistan, for Kazakhstan, so we could really see what is the priority because when you say that Kazakhstan is priority, but at the same time it is big and you can really weight them with uh, Kyrgyzstan, for example. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Good suggestions. We'll definitely take them into account. But I think uh, I could do it for you, by the way. Uh, uh, it's not only limited to uh, the AI and the Chinese project. Then we have to work on other things as well. <laughs> so uh, comparing square uh, meters, territory, population, um, and I don't know, like uh, economic development level, uh, human development indexes. Those are all very interesting, but it will be very difficult for us and time consuming to do the things. So maybe uh, the idea was that we present information on the project themselves. And if someone is working on the on the, um, like uh, you know like economic development index and the Chinese project in Central Asia, they can use our database as a reference point and then make their own analysis, including those that you have just highlighted. You, you can have the Telegram channel where you can publish it. Oh yeah, that, that would be one way of discrimination. Like You're coming that's into very practical topics, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Very good suggestion. So, thank you very much for what I think that's, uh, well, you, we got a very good impression of what is the database is about. Thank you, and uh, if, you don't, if you don't mind, we will proceed with the next presentation. Well, the time forces us to do that. So, our next uh, colleague, our next presenter is Dr. Bakhtiyor Eshanov, uh, who is uh, currently senior lecturer in economics at Westminster International University in, Tash in Tashkent. And he has a PhD in applied economics from Free University of Brussels, Belgium. And he has uh, experience of working for Asian Development Bank and teaching at uh, Academy of Public Administration under the President of Uzbekistan. And now he's working on this topic, which is uh, development of renewable energy in Central Asia. As, as before, we have some time for presentation and then question and answer session. Bakhtiyar, please. Hello, good afternoon, colleagues. And thanks for this wonderful chance. Thanks for this wonderful chance of uh, presenting our collaborative effort. And today I'll be uh, talking about the second series of reports. Uh, the topicality this time is renewable energy resources. And uh, as you know, we can talk for hours about renewable energy sources and uh, the energy policies in Central Asia. But today I'll try to make it short and limit with what we have uh, aimed at and what we achieved in the, in the end. Initially, we were very ambitious, and it, you, you, should, you should target for a higher uh, aim. Eh? Therefore, we uh, initially wanted to have spatially explicit maps or data for each city or at least for each meteor station about wind power, solar power, and then biomass or bio residues available for specific areas, and then uh, ended up uh, having the resources which you have on the table uh, and we will uh, still be presenting a few more reports uh, in addition to these ones in the uh, coming week. We start with... Oh, thank you. Before talking about renewable energy sources, let me... Let's start with this boring table which demonstrates the peculiarities of our uh, Central Asian countries' uh, energy sectors. Huh? You see that every country, you already know the uh, table not necessarily demonstrates this, but every country has a single dominant resor res resource uh, uh, in their energy balance. Kazakhstan is uh, mainly 
coal in the Kazakhstan's energy sector mainly relies on coal and oil. Kyrgyzstan relies on, heavily relies on large scale hydropower. Uh, the same is true for Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan heavily relies on natural gas, where the share of natural gas is more than 90% in the energy balance. And in this environment, uh, what can we do with the renewables? That was the interesting question we wanted to tackle. So, before I start describing the theoretical and technically available potential that we have collected, the data on technical and theoretical uh, renewable energy potential that we have collected. May I ask your gut feeling about which energy source has the highest potential in Central Asia? Uh, yeah, please. Don't. Yeah, ma'am, over there. Solar, solar, energy. solar energy. Quite right. Solar is the most evenly distributed resource in the uh, step but wind has the highest potential which is not evenly distributed among the Central Asian countries. And here you see from the chart that uh, Kazakhstan can meet its current energy demand to 20 times with the available wind power. And same is true and even more for all other Central Asian countries. You can Look at, uh, you, you can exploit this data, explore this data more uh, precisely when we publish the electronic versions. So I will not go into the very much details, but here you have the classes, wind speed, and uh, this is a general, generalized data obtained from natural, uh, National Labor Renewable Energy Laboratory of the U.S. Department of State, and uh, we have prepare this data using their uh, general data. Yeah. Solar power potential, uh, again, twice less than, as you see, uh, the wind power for Kazakhstan, and uh, a bit higher for Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, where, where the countries are located uh, to the south, and solar irradiation is more direct, therefore, uh, if you look at per square kilometer area, some of the parts of Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan have the highest uh, technically viable potential for solar PV application. And these numbers demonstrate, present the hypothetical volume of electricity that could be generated if the countries are completely covered with 10% conversion efficiency panels. And the descriptions will be available uh, in the data sets, so uh, for the moment you might be confused to see uh, those numbers only without any uh, explanations, but uh, the data set itself is very precise. Hydropower, the most widespread to date uh, renewable energy source in Central Asia. You see, uh, Kazakhstan has abundant, all the Central Asian countries have abundant hydropower pot uh, uh, potential except Turkmenistan, which is very downstream and both uh, one of the river basins do not reach Kazakhstan. Amudarya partly reaches Kazakhstan and Sirdarya does not. Therefore, Turkmenistan has relatively limited potential. Nevertheless, uh, if you look at the current exploitation rate, Uzbekistan has already exploited 40% of the existing technically feasible potential. But when you keep up exploiting more and more of this uh, single resource, every next unit becomes more expensive. So Uzbekistan kind of reached its peak uh, compared with for example, Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan. Eh? This is about uh, the hydropower. Now uh, we can also review the renewable energy support policies available in Central Asia. Uh, except Turkmenistan, all the Central Asian 
uh, countries have precise renewable energy targets and state programs, feed-in tariffs or premium payments are established, introduced only in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Kazakhstan goes one step forward and uh, pays a premium if the solar system is pre prepared, uh, pr pr produced in Kazakhstan. Uh, net metering is available in Kazakhstan and trading with renewable energy certification certificate is uh, established in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Uh, Uzbekistan only has a renewable energy target for the rest. Uh, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan uh, are lagging behind their counterparts, their peers uh, in terms of support policies. And which is again true for financial institutions incentives made available for renewable energy support, energy production payments, uh, power purchasing agreements are established in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, investments, production, tax credits are available again for these uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Tajikistan, public investments, loans or grants are uh, also made available so these uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan has very precise and uh, well-developed state programs to develop renewable energy. Uh, reduction, or a tax exemption, exemptions, CO2, uh, tax exemptions, and also VAT exemptions are available for renewable energy introducers in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. This is, these are the financial in incentives which are made available for renewable energy deployment. And now if you look at the costs, uh, you are aware that renewable energy sources, especially solar, is one of the rapidly... Uh, uh, solar has the, one of the rapidly declining costs. And this chart demonstrates the levelized cost of electricity, uh, uh, the average normalized cost of electricity over the lifespan of the station project and you see uh, the cost of solar panels, solar PV systems has declined by 15 times over the last 30 years. Uh, this uh, the, the final data is uh, relevant for 2017 but for the next year 2018 uh, renewable energy sources price kept declining and today uh, for some of the countries including uh, Uzbekistan for which I have data renewable energy is more even even more viable than hydropower um, uh, economically viable economically more feasible than uh, hydropower for instance if you want to install one megawatt of Hydropower, small hydropower station in Uzbekistan that would cost you three to five millions depending on the location, depending on whether you need reservoir and so on. But for grid connected solar PV system, one megawatt would cost you one million dollars and with storage that would cost you around two million dollars. Uh, which demonstrates that non-traditional renewable energy resources. Renewable re energy resources which used to be alien for this region are now becoming more and more economically feasible. Uh, still, hydropower is more uh, preferred by the governments, uh, larger part of the government, larger part of the projects being implemented in, in the Central Asian countries are uh, uh, hydropower projects and these projects uh, uh, keep in the, in the next five years it will be dominating renewable energy uh, development will be dominated by the hydropower and we have to remember that hydropower uh, has this water energy nexus problem we have in Central Asia, uh, water is not only used for generating electricity, it's also used for uh, agriculture purposes and we will have to find a golden balance between how we can uh, uh, use 
to what extent we can exploit hydropower further and to what extent should we be relying on uh, agriculture in the future. But hydropower also is a supporting mechanism for introducing the other energy types like wind which is not always regular as well as solar which has a fluctuation during the day and night. Huh? Uh, hydropower balancing could be a promising solution for combined use of renewable energy sources when you have uh, abundant solar irradiation during the day and then uh, you swap to switch to hydropower during the evening and that is uh, fast hydropower balancing. Uh, this offers us a very the currently developing renewable, the currently developing hydropower potential will allow us to foster the development of, of other sources, uh, which we uh, have found out from our uh, investigations or data gathering. Installed and planned projects. Very shortly about uh, the installed and planned projects. Kazakhstan is the champion in terms of renewable energy application today. They have uh, the most number of solar projects that has been deployed, the most number of wind projects actually. Kazakhstan is uh, one of the leaders globally in, when it comes to wind power, power in, new wind power in, uh, introduction. And that is partly uh, facilitated by uh, Expo 2017. Kyrgyzstan, hydropower and biogas have been dominating, but there is a huge potential also for solar and wind. And uh, Tajikistan is still relying more on large and small hydropower, but they have also abundant uh, solar and wind uh, potentials to exploit. Turkmenistan has almost 100% of its technically available rest potential to be exploited in the future. Today, contribution of renewable energy sources is insignificant and that is including one hydropower station they have which is more than uh, a century uh, long uh, which has more than a century long history. Uzbekistan solar is more appropriate solution uh, according to the data it is more evenly distributed uh, wind is a seasonal solution for most of the places and only in a couple of mountainous areas it, is a, it has a regular potential, uh, non-stop potential. So you will have four uh, reports on uh, renewable energy policies, renewable, uh, wind power potential, solar potential and hydro potential and eventually we will publish the biomass potential of uh, Central Asian countries. And when it comes to key fund findings, uh, the data is for you to discover, explore, explore and uh, we didn't go further than this to uh, leave you and uh, us a room for future research. Yeah? So uh, I will be most happy to continue collaboration. I am very happy to answer your immediate questions. And if you have more questions in the future about the data, uh, uh, about more uh, scrutinized versions of some of the tables and we'll be most happy to provide them. Thank you very much.